This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. I'm so pleased to be joined uh, from Israel, the author of a brand new book entitled The Virtue of Nationalism. His name is Dr. Yoram Hazoni, and as he explains to me, uh, that's my bad American-ish a pronunciation of his last name, not the Hebrew one. So his new book is something that we rushed out and got uh, via Amazon. I read it a couple weeks ago, and it's asking some some really important questions, and it's getting a lot of play out there in Time Magazine. He was recently on the Laura Ingram Show, et cetera, et cetera. This is someone you ought to be following on Twitter. So, Dr. Zoe, let me ask you this first. Uh, there's some books out there right now talking about the failures of liberalism. Uh, yeah. th- this book is different. Uh, from my perspective, anyway, it's making, the, it's ask, at least asking the question, is nationalism inherently illiberal? Right. Well, I, I, I think some of the books that you're talking about are, are um, looking at liberalism as though liberalism just is equivalent to the American experiment. Mm. And, uh, and, and, and so there, there, there are people who I think for uh, not not entirely for bad reasons, who are saying, look where look where America's ended up right now, and th- they're asking whether there's something fundamentally flawed about it. Now, m- my point of view is is somewhat different. I I certainly don't think that the American founding was was a misfounding or a mistake. I I, I see it as one of the greatest and noblest ex- experiments in in political history. But I, I definitely am sympathetic to the view that the, that in the last generation or two or three, it depends on what you, what you're looking at, what you're counting, um, that things have definitely moved away from what I see as the uh, kind of classical American uh, nationalist vision, which was a vision of America as an independent nation conducting its own experiment, which was going to contribute and has contributed greatly uh, to to all mankind through this experiment. Since the fall of the Berlin Wall, especially, um, we've heard both from Democrats and Republicans, and this is echoed across Europe as well, um, a uh, an enthusiasm for a a project of imposing a unified law on the entire world, and I, I understand that the uh, most of the people who are are behind this are very well intentioned and very well meaning, and I, I think they simply don't understand that the uh, the elimination of the concept of a world of independent nations, each one of them pursuing its own course and conducting its own experiment is itself a very great danger to the American experiment and mm-hmm. to v- various other countries. It, if you are a liberal, uh, I, I myself see myself as a conservative, but if you are a liberal and you believe in American liberalism, you should definitely be extremely worried about uh, the the move to create a uh, a worldwide liberal empire, which is going to dictate to America how its liberalism or how its uh, uh, government and society are going to work, because uh, Germans and French don't see things the way that Americans do. Well, this is so interesting because you have a, a chapter entitled uh, Liberalism as Imperialism. I love that title. Th- there's a sense a growing sense that Westerners are, and especially Americans, are trying to impose something on the rest of the world, and that's liberalism, generally in the form of social democracy. And and you seem to be one of the only people making this point. I don't know if I'm. I don't. I don't know if I'm. I'm, I'm one of the 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 only people making the pointing to the problem, but I I, I may be one of the main people saying uh, saying imperialism is when you decide that. A, that your values, the way you see and do things, are completely universalizable, that they can be applied in any time and place, and B, that you're so right that you simply have to impose it on others by force. And uh, without quite noticing it, this definition of imperialism is exactly what uh, Americans, Democrats, and Republicans have slipped into in the last generation. 
not only thinking that their own ideas can are, can be un, universally applied, which you know that we can we can argue and debate, but even that they should be imposed, which gives us a foreign policy that, well, as we can see from from Yugoslavia to Somalia and and uh, Iraq to Libya, uh, one attempt after another to to try to um, to impose by force a uh, an American view of what the world is supposed to be like. It it hasn't worked out well for those nations. And it hasn't worked out well for America. And so mm-hmm. I, I think it's very important to to think now about political ideas and political ideals and where exactly we want to stand on these things. But but here's what, what bothers me is a lot of the same people who believe in universal precepts that good ideas ought to be good ideas everywhere, uh, political precepts, for example, are the same people who spent the 20th century talking about democracy. Doesn't each level of supranational governments necessarily sort of attenuate democracy, attenuate the individual's ability to, to, to live as he or she wants? That, that's, what, that's exactly what we see in Europe. Is, it, people, people keep talking about the European Union mm-hmm. as though it's an experiment in, in democracy, and it's not. There, it's nothing like a democracy. It's precisely the severing of uh, the, the the self-government of different nations in Europe and their self-determination. It, it's ending it. Just, just take a look at the way the way that the, the that the Germans are are deciding what's going to happen economically in Greece, or the the Italians just elected a, a new government. They have who they want to be finance minister, and Brussels vetoes their finance minister. I mean, I mean, you can't even you can't even imagine something like this taking place, and and it's here it's taking place, and people are saying this is this, this is democracy. This is not democracy. This is this is actually exactly the way that democracy dies. Well, it's interesting to me. Of course, we are uh, big fans of uh, both Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek, both of both of whom you quote. In your book, it's interesting to me, though, that you use the same term Mises frequently used, and it sounds old-fashioned now, self-determination. You don't hear yeah. that phrase anymore. Did you use that purposely? Was, did, you, did, you, uh, did, you, uh, did that strike you in Mises' book, Liberalism? Well, I, I think self-determination is a, uh, is a very popular term among nationalists. It's something that, uh, that if if you hang out with the kind of people who are are thinking about national independence, it's it's actually uh, a Kantian. It's actually a Kantian term. Yeah. And I'm, I'm I'm not a great fan of of Kant, but I I do love love this expression. Um, I I don't I, I'm not a I I'm not a big expert in uh, in Mises, and I'm I'm eager to learn more. I quote him in the book uh, from. Uh, from the 1920s, 30s, when mm-hmm. he and Hayek were thinking about the the world as kind of like um, like a a big extension of the the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and I don't know so much about what they they thought in later life about uh, in the independence of nations. So I'm I'm eager to learn more about it. Well, if it, I'll push back a little bit and and I'll say that I think Nate, Mises might have seen a bigger role for the nation state. Uh, than perhaps some of his pulled quotes from lib- liberalism would suggest. And we will also post with this interview an, an article by Joe Salerno, which is very much on this topic. But but nonetheless, uh, I, I personally am pleased that you uh, sought out and quoted Mises as an avatar of liberalism in, in that sort of 20s uh, genre. You know, you bring up Kant, and and one thing is, of course, he had his idea that the only the only way we'll have perpetual peace, the only way reason will reign supreme, is if we get rid of these old clunky nation states and finally right. have this, this, this global governance. And so it's, it's not j- just something new. And, and to me, there's a, an awful lot of hubris in that perspective. And, and we never call it hubris. We just, uh, liberals today just assume that, that we should all see the rightness of this. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I, you know, I, I remember as a kid when I first heard John Lennon's Imagine, and and I thought, oh my gosh, I, I must have been like twelve or something. And I thought, well, what a horrible song. <laughs> but 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 then I thought, you know, it's just a, it's just a pop song. And then 
you know, then as as an adult, I, you know, it, it, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, we start, suddenly start hearing about the New World Order from 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 George H. W. Bush. Pre- President Bush is telling us that for literally for a thousand generations, mankind has striven to has has tried to reach this moment and failed, but now we're actually going to achieve it. And what is it? It's the replacement of the what he called the replacement of the law of the jungle with with the rule of law. Now that concept of a worldwide rule of law, that's exactly the Kantian idea. It's amazing to think about it that that 200 years after Kant, it's 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 Republican President George Bush who becomes the spokesman for the idea that the Security Council of the United Nations or 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 some other kind of uh, uh, world bodies are capable of of legislating a law for all nations that's going to bind all of us, and I I think that hubris is exactly the right word. It is it's an astonishing, absolutely astonishing piece of arrogance to think that your mind or your organization or your philosophy is is so fully proven that there's no need anymore for the competition of 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 different philosophies and different legal systems and different experiments because because we've reached the final answer and i think in 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 that sense my uh my view of this actually does uh i i think fit very well with with mises and hayek with their their understanding of the limitations of human reason, the limitations of the ability of uh, a particular individual or theory to grasp the whole. How about competition within a nation state, though? You have an interesting chapter about the myth of the federal solution. You point out some of the failures of the U.S. Constitution, the failures of the EU to represent individual nations' interests. Um, What do you think of subsidiarity, localism, uh, uh, secession generally? Well, Secession is a different different subject, but subsi- the localism, federalism, subsidiarity, there is a way of understanding these things uh, that I'm completely in favor of. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I don't I don't argue that federalism uh, should not be used. My argument is that that people who think that a, a worldwide federalism, right, that, that that's the point that I'm responding to is that people like Kant, who think that federalism can be a solution for the whole globe? I, I, I think that they 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 don't understand that the purpose of federalism is to grant the greatest possible autonomy to uh, lower levels. And I'm completely on that that side of political theory. I think that the 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 closer you are to to the ground to 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 a local population in terms of decision making the more likely it is that the, that the decisions are going to reflect the, the actual needs and concerns and interests of of the people in that in, in in that sense federalism is great but federalism also means that there is a central federal government and that central federal government always has a responsibility and i think people mi- often miss this it has a responsibility to set the boundaries for what is legitimate in the subsidiary um, states or locales. So examples are the American federal government determining that uh, that slavery was not going to be legal in the United States, mm-hmm. which, you know, a, a, a decision that I certainly su- support, or uh, the American federal government deciding that it, it was going to stamp out polygamy in Utah. Right. The, these are examples that I support. You can come up with many other examples that I think are more questionable from more recent federal decisions by the American government. But the point is that federalism has two sides to it. On the one hand, uh, the greatest possible autonomy within a certain range of subjects. On the other hand, it always is the federal government that's determining what the legitimate range is. And when it comes, when you start talking about um, Federalism out. Federalism works when when there's a certain common commonality of civilization and mm-hmm. culture, and so m- the great majority of the people say in the United States are are willing to accept the boundaries uh, that the federal government is imposing. But now try to do think about that on a global scale. Th- that commonality doesn't exist. 
by having a world federal government, basically what you're saying is that somebody's going to determine for the whole planet what what the bounds of legitimate experiment are. And, mm-hmm. and there's nothing, you can't imagine something more dangerous than that, even if it could be benevolent and decent for one generation. What's it going to be in the next generation? I mean, you just don't want to create, none of us want to see a world power that has that kind of authority. Because human beings are just flawed. It, the, the, they'll be decent for, for the first 10 <laughs> years. And, yeah. and then, yeah. you know, just imagine what's going to happen. So I, I don't ever want to see a worldwide federal government. And it's not because I'm against federalism. Federalism has to work within nations. But one of the great points you make is that the, the concept of a nation state can actually limit the contagion uh, in terms of war and, and famine and all kinds of problems. Uh, yeah, this is this is an important point, also frequently underestimated. I mean, I think I think people are more familiar with the idea that that the family unit is a bulwark against tyranny. I think I think that's something that's been uh, often discussed in the literature is the fact that each family is basically uh, each family unit is is basically a sphere in which. Um, uh, the, the 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 father the mother create uh, in effect they they create a value system that's unique to them and they inculcate it in among their children and that ability to inculcate over decades mm-hmm. a certain way of viewing things that is in fact a great bulwark against tyranny because you get when you get a a, a tyrant who says i want everybody to be the same i want everybody to be the way i the way i want them to be it's people who were raised in solid families who are uh, immediately the first to say well you know i i'm sorry i have other loyalties besides you know the loyalty to the dictator mm-hmm. i i can i, I under, have an understanding that's independent of the dictator i think this is very well understood i think less understood is that the variety of national states the diversity of, of independent national states works just like the diversity of families and independent families, except except on a on a much larger scale. It's it's the uh, the unique nationalisms uh, of different independent nations, which have always stood up as the uh, as the most powerful resistance to worldwide empire, to universal imperialism, and to universal ideologies. So, I mean, if, if you just take world take World War II, um, people don't u- remember this this way necessarily. But I think it's very clear that w- what happened in World War II was the Allies. When people talk about the Allies, they're talking about the Allied nations. Mm -hmm. The way that the Allies presented themselves in radio broadcasts to Europe was Hitler is an imperialist. His aim is to enslave the world. Our goal is not to replace his empire with our empire. Our goal is to replace his empire with independent nations. Our goal is to free the enslaved nations and give them independence. Now, it's American nationalism. And English nationalism, in the end, even Russian nationalism, because historically what happened was that even Stalin gave up on his Marxist claptrap during World War II in order to rally the Russian people by declaring that this was a great patriotic war. And so in the end, the force that defeated Hitler was 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 these three nationalisms, you know, pl- plus French nationalism and Polish nationalism. And it it is the the unique love of a given nation and its way of doing things that is the strongest political bulwark that we have against every empire every attempt to impose a single view on the world oh that's that's a fantastic answer i i, I agree completely you know you've got this new article in time magazine <clears throat> you've spent a lot of time in the united states recently you've seen all the divisiveness with trump um and you point, you know, you talk about commonality and federalism. What give us some advice? What could that commonality be? It, it, you point out in the U.S., it's not about whiteness, but neither is it about some abstract idea of what it means to be American. That there's got to be something more concrete than that. And I feel like we're we're searching for it. Look, the the the, the Americans are part of uh, the greatest political tradition of you know, of, uh, uh, of the last thousand years, which is the, the, the 
Anglo-American tradition of uh, nationalism, limited government, individual liberties, and that tradition has, to a large extent, been uprooted, uh, both from 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 the public consciousness in English-speaking countries and also in academia, where um, there you know, most most departments that teach that study and teach political theory or political philosophy or or law um, or history of ideas, most of them are at this point um, divided between professors who are some 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 version or another of Marxists mm -hmm. and professors who are some version of, or another of let, let's call it revolutionary liberals. Um, liberals who uh, think that think that uh, the ideas they believe in come from pure reason without any kind of historical experience mm -hmm. and that there's no need to know anything about that 1,000 years of development of the Anglo-American political tradition. And I, I think those traditions have to be returned to. Uh, America, America has, in fact, the, the greatest traditions uh, of, uh, of, of any nation in, in the world, but it doesn't study them and it doesn't appreciate them. And let, let me just give you an example of what, I, of what I'm talking about. Um, the, there, right now, today, uh, on the bestseller lists and in, in public debate, there, there are quite a few professors and other intellectuals, best-selling authors, who talk about uh, the United States as though it was uh, a miracle that took place in 17, 1776 mm -hmm. or 1787. And what they leave out is, uh, is the fact that the American Constitution is an adaptation of the traditional English Constitution to the American context. Sure. Now, what, what I'm talking about is uh, is due process of law, the the idea of checks and balances, limited government, uh, the the uh, the the property is a cornerstone of individual liberties and economic prosperity, the bicameral legislature. You can just go on and on and on, but that's not the only side to this tradition. This tradition was also a religious tradition. So I I think I think there's still a lot of health in America. As I know it, but I I do think that people are going to have to step forward and say, look, we have old and good traditions, and those traditions, you know, they can be updated a little bit for for our time, but those traditions are what held our people together, and without them, all, all sorts of terrible things can come, and I'm I'm afraid for that. Well. We're out of time. All I can say is it's a good thing you're an academic working in Israel where you can say these things because nobody says them in the U.S. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the best way to follow Dr. Yoram Hazoni is probably via his Twitter account. There you can find out his book, which is in Amazon, which is doing well. You can find him his article uh, in, in the current issue of Time magazine. Uh, doctor, we appreciate your time so much, and we congratulate you on all your success. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.